All right. Okay. So we've talked about uh, overcomers. We've talked about the man child, and they're, they're both one and the same. So now we need to get to the 144,000. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah, what a nice number. 144,000. So here we go. All right. <clears throat> So first of all, you got, I'm sure everyone realizes that the book of Revelation, it mentions these 144,000 in two different places, right? So the first place is in Revelation 7, verse 4, it says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of, of, of the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed, okay? So that's, that's our first mention of them. And then the second mention is in Revelation 14 where it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I think I had mentioned before that, you know, probably, you know, our first question should be, you know, are, are these the same 144,000? Are they a different group of 144,000? Uh, that's something that we, we should be thinking about. So what we're going to do is we're going to make, this is, one of the, this is one of the ways your chiastic structure helps you out. So we've already figured out that, hey, you know, the book of Revelation is arranged, is written, is written in, in two halves, is written in, uh, in two halves, where the themes in the first half repeat in reverse order. So we're going to take advantage of that, <clears throat> and we're going to look at element D and D prime, element D and D prime, because that's where we have Revelation 7 through 10 and then Revelation 14 through 16. So Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. So we're going to look to the chiastic nature uh, of the book of Revelation to see what we can find out. So we're going we're gonna to key in here on Revelation 7, 1 through 17. And it's, it's really only the first few verses. But remember, D1, uh, verses 1 through 17, they share a number of themes. Remember, we looked at them. They shared nine themes with uh, D1 Prime, Revelation 14, 1 through 20. So there were nine themes. We looked at each one of those individually. Um, but what we want to do is we want to take a look at this passage and see what we can find out. So <clears throat> what, we wanna, what we're seeing here is that the 144,000 in chapter 7 are obviously thematically connected to the 144,000 in chapter 14. They're the same group. That's basically all, all this is, is showing us, Okay. So Adonai arranged it. He had John write this in such a way that once you understand that it's written in this chiastic pattern, then the 144,000 in the first half, they match exactly where the 144,000 are in the second half. And so they are, they are one and the same. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to look at the unique characteristics of the 144,000. Because the whole idea here at this point is, is who are these 144,000? Who are they? And so the way we're going to do that is just like with the man-child, just with the overcomers, we're going to make some connections. We're going to look at the connections that Adonai put uh, in there for us, okay? So Revelation 7, 1 through 8 is the first mention of the 144,000. And um, so again, <clears throat> it talks about how they were sealed, okay? It says that they were sealed in their foreheads. And again, uh, what, we, what we'll do is we'll make use of uh, the chiastic structure, and um, we'll make use of that chiastic structure. So the first thing I want to do is, before, so it starts numbering them, I think, in verse 5, 5 through 8 in chapter 7. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Revelation 7, 1 through 4. And Revelation 7, 1 through 4 it's written as a, as a small parallelism, okay? So we're going to take a look at it and see what we can learn from it. Um, and we're doing this because once we understand Revelation 7, 1 through 4, that's how we'll be able to pick out the first unique theme about the 144,000, okay? So we're looking at, we're going to look at about, I think it's about seven themes, uh, yeah, about seven unique themes that characterize 144,000. But for this first one, we have to understand the first four, ver four verses. So, um, again, um, what I'm going to do is, why well, I'm going to go ahead and bring all these up here at one time, and then we're going to read through them. So, <clears throat> this is just the first four verses here in order. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, 
saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then it goes ahead and it talks about the 144,000. Okay? So what's important here, though, is to realize uh, that this passage is written in, in a parallel structure. So let's just look at elements B and B prime. B and B prime. So B says, on the earth, on the sea, and on any tree. Okay? Well, that's easily thematically connected to B prime, which, saying, which says, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. So you can see that um, the theme in element B here is repeated in the second half in the same order. So it's A, B, C, A, B, C. So it's a parallel structure. And then we can see the same thing with element C. So with element C, it says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, right? And then element C prime in the second half, it says, Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of the children of Israel were sealed. Okay, again, and so the, the key word there is in element C, having the seal of the living God. And then we see the word sealed uh, mentioned about three or four more times. Okay, so that's what's establishing this, this, this uh, parallelism. So if we compare A to A prime, notice what A says. This is after, the things, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of earth. And it says they were holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow, okay? So the question is, well, what does that mean? What is the significance of these four angels um, holding the four winds uh, of the earth so that they won't blow? And so what, what I want to suggest to you is that the answer is right here in A prime. We already know that this is written as a parallelism with B and B prime, C and C prime, so A and A prime is, is just a natural candidate. So the answer for what does it mean to hold the four winds of the earth is in A prime. So we talked in A, we talked about four angels, and then in A prime, we talk about four angels. But in A, we talk about holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow, and that's connected to where it says, whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So these four angels who are holding the four winds of the earth, those are winds of destruction, okay? Those are winds of calamity of the, tri of, of the tribulation period, okay? And so the, the holding of the four winds of the earth is the harm to the earth and the sea. So what we see is that the, the, the 144,000, they're saying, look, before there's anything that starts happening in this great, and I mean the great tribulation, I'm talking about the last three and a half years, before that even begins, we need to seal the servants of our God. So they're sealed right before, okay? So we're going to look at this another way, though. So that's, that's basically comparing A and A prime. The holding of the four winds of the earth is equivalent to the ability to harm the earth and the sea. So, the, so it's like, okay, let's just hold on. We're not going to do this. Now, let's just look at this expression, the four corners of the earth and the four winds of the earth. What does that mean? It's a figure of speech, okay? And we're going to look at Matthew 24, 31, and we're going to see what it looks like. And he's, he's, he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect. Now, notice what it says. Here. It says, from the four winds, comma, from one end of heaven to the other. So this is just a common Hebrew idiom where they will say, what they mean, and then they will repeat the actual meaning. So when he says to gather his elect from the four winds, if you want to know what from the four winds means, well, he tells you from one end of heaven to the other. That's what from the four winds means. From the four winds, from the four winds, it means it's a figure of speech for the entirety of heaven, from the entire heaven. That's what the four, that's what the four, what the four wind, the four corners are, right? The four, the four corners. <clears throat> um, from the four, I'm sorry, four winds. From the four winds, all right, definition, from, the, from one end of heaven to the other. It's all inclusive, okay, is what, it, is, is what he's saying there, okay? So um, element A in Revelation 7-1 informs us that all the winds of the earth will be stopped, but it's, it's uh, Revelation 7-2 
that informs us what it, what it means by we're going to hold those winds and we're not going to let them blow. It means that we're not going to allow harm to, to occur on the earth. So we're talking about the winds of harm here are the anticipated harm from the calamities of the Great Tribulation. And I, ha- I have here a verse from Jeremiah 49, 34 through 38, where it says, now I've broken the passage up into just the parts I want you to see. Adonai says he's going to break the bow of Elam. It gets Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. So here we go. I'm going to bring the four winds on Elam. And what does that mean? Well, it means that he's going to scatter them towards those four winds. He's going to bring disaster upon them. He's going to send the sword after them. He's going to consume them. He's going to destroy them from there, right? In other words, those are winds of tribulation and destruction, okay? So I'm not saying that Jeremiah 49 is necessarily uh, directly, and I'm not. I'm not saying that that is uh, the tribulation winds. What I'm showing here is that the four winds, right, from the four quarters of heaven, I'm giving you another place in Scripture that is showing that the four winds are winds of destruction and calamity. Okay, they're winds of destruction and calamity. So it's not the first time that the Bible has used the idea of releasing the four winds and those four winds meaning all sorts of destruction and calamity. Okay, so again, we're just, you know, just making the connections, letting the the scriptures uh, uh, connect that for us. But even greater evidence uh, in in support of our assertion that the phrase, um, the four winds, that it's about destruction on the earth, is just how they mention the earth on the sea and on any tree found in Revelation 7, 1, okay? And the phrase, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees found in Revelation 7, 3. So in that passage that we read, Revelation 7, 1 through 4, it mentions the earth, the sea, and the trees two separate times, okay? And the reason why, uh, so another reason why we know that these winds are the winds of destruction, meaning the tribulation destruction, is because it's these very portions of the creation that are specifically targeted and mentioned as recipients of divine judgment during the great tribulation, okay? So the first three trumpet judgments bring disaster upon what? The earth the seas and the trees, okay? So when we, when we go and look at those first three trumpet judgments, they're against the earth, the trees, and the seas, okay? And so that's exactly uh, what Revelation 7, 1 through 4 is talking about, is uh, the tribulation winds. So it appears that the 144,000 are protected from the great tribulation by their marking, okay? So that's what's going to protect them. They're going to be preserved. And what I want to do is I want to look at Ezekiel chapter 9, and we have a similar situation when Adonai was about to bring judgment upon Jerusalem. Starting in verse 3, now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And Adonai said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Okay? So he's saying, I want you to go and I want you to mark the people in their foreheads, who are bemoaning all of the sin in in Jerusalem. To others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. Do not, but do not come near anyone who, on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple Then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. 
Okay, so as it was, while they, were ki- while they were killing them, I was left alone, and I fell on my face and cried out and said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say, The Lord has forsaken the land, and the Lord does not see, and as for me also, my eye Will I not spare, nor will I have pity, but I will recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then the man clothed with the linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back and said, I have done just as you have commanded. Okay? And so Ezekiel, he sees that there are certain ones that get marked on the forehead. And and what happens? Those ones are the ones preserved from the judgments. And then Ezekiel also sees the, the utter slaughter, and he says, Lord, are, are you going to totally destroy? You're not going to hardly leave anyone left? And remember I told you when we first started that the book of Revelation of the Torah is what? Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses. The Song of Moses, if you want to read the book of, if you want to read what the Torah has to say about the, the, the Reve- if you want to read what the Torah has to say about the book of Revelation, it's found in Deuteronomy 32. And when you read Deuteronomy 32, it's the same as here. He says, you know what? He's going to judge his people Israel, and it's, he's going to take it to the point where they're almost totally annihilated and wiped out. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what's going to happen. Okay, to the point where there's almost none left, and then that's when he's going to roar forth, and he's going to save that remnant. He's going he's to come, and he's going to save the remnant. But it's the, it's the same thing here, you know, with, with, with the 144,000. So this right here is just a, a good example of what that marking on the forehead is for. That marking is to preserve them. So unique characteristic number one is that the 144,000 will not have to endure the time of testing known as the Great Tribulation, okay? They're going to get a pass in the sense that, uh, and and I don't think it's that they won't be around. I think they're going to be around. I I don't know exactly, you know, okay, Lord, you need to show us what's going on with 144,000. But they are not going to be suffering, uh, because of, the, of, of what's going on in, in the tribulation. They are going to be preserved. Just like, as I said, in the battle of Midian, when Adonai said, go take vengeance on the, on the Midianites, that is a prophetic battle of the last days in the book of Revelation. They took 1,000 from each tribe for a total of 12,000, and then they were praising Adonai because in the entire battle against Midian and Moab, not one person was killed, not one of those 12,000. And there are pictures of this 144,000 where uh, all of them are going to be preserved, and just like in Ezekiel 9 also. So another unique theme or characteristic about the 144,000 is that they have the seal of God on their foreheads, okay? So we saw that they have the seal of God, and the nature of that seal, we've are, and, and so we can, we can actually look at the nature of this seal. So in, Reve, in Revelation 7, uh, uh, 1 through 4, it just says that they were sealed in their foreheads, right? But again, if we use our chiastic structure, what we know is that Revelation 7 is thematically connected to Revelation 14. And in Revelation 14, we learn, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So it says they were sealed in their foreheads in Revelation 7, but in Revelation 14, it gives you the nature of the seal. It's more specific. It gives you more information. It tells you that the seal is having the father's name written on their foreheads. That's what the actual seal is, Okay. So again, you know, just by under, you know by understanding uh, un- understanding how the how this how how the entire book of Revelation is is uh, is organized, seven points you right to fourteen element D and D prime. Boom, it's just right there. There's no guesswork. So unique characteristic number two is that um, the hundred and forty four thousand. Um, They have the Father's name written on their foreheads, okay, these 144,000, 
All right? So let's look at unique characteristic number three. Number, the characteristic number three is that these are the ones who were not defiled with women for they are virgins. So it speaks of their purity, okay? It speaks of their purity, all right? Now, <clears throat> so all while I have studied this, where it says they are virgins, I have always, up until this week, <laughs> I've always thought, okay, well, it says they're virgins. I didn't think that that was, was like literal virgins. I just thought it, what I was thinking that it meant was that uh, they, are, they are spiritual virgins. In other words, they never participated in any kind of harlotry at all. Because you know how the Bible, the, Bible used, the Bible uses harlotry in a, specific, in a specific sense as far as Adonai's people are concerned. It uses harlotry um, uh, to speak of if you go after false gods, okay? If you worship other false gods, that's called harlotry. That's called going and joining yourself to a harlot. So that's how I always looked at that. And until this week, you know, I, I, I started thinking, you know, they may be physically virgins. I, I, I don't know, okay? So, you know, Lord, you know, he'll, uh, he, he'll either show us or we'll, we'll, you know, some kind of way we'll find out. So I'm not going to exclude that. Um, but again, as I said, I just really started thinking about that because I started thinking about it, it's something very special when someone dedicates themselves in their life to Adonai. And I'm thinking about these 144,000 because they're people, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They, they, these, these are people who have given it all. I think of Jephthah's daughter, right? So, you know, every, every, you know when Jephthah's daughter... When, when she comes in and he's like, ah, alas, my daughter, right? And everyone thinks that he killed, he didn't kill his daughter, okay? He offered her up as a whole burn offering. You know what he did? And, and it, tells us, it tells us what that means. It's not that he killed her. They understood the true significance of a whole burn offering. A whole burn offering, that that, that animal that was offered, it was on the behalf of the offerer, and it was that person saying, I'm offering myself in complete obedience to the commandments. That's what it was. And so they tell us what, what, he, what, what she did. She took a vow of chastity. She never married. It goes on to tell you that. It says she never married. That was her offering herself as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. She never married. It wasn't that Jephthah went and killed her. He didn't do that. They understood the significance of the whole burnt offering. And see, and, and, and the whole burnt offering is about us, Romans 12, 1 through 2, right? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Adonai, which is your reasonable service. So everyone thinks that, you know, everyone thinks that Jephthah, you know, killed his daughter because he said, well, whatever comes out of that door, the first thing that comes out of the door of my house, I'm going to offer it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord, right? And she offered herself just as, as, as Isaac. Isaac was, offer, was offered too, okay, as a whole burnt offering, right? And the ram was substituted for him, okay? The ram was substituted. Even though, I, even though Abraham was actually going to do it, Abraham was going to sacrifice him because that is what Adonai said. But at the last second, mm, at the last second, Adonai, Abraham looks up and he sees the ram and then the sacrifice was made. And so that ram substituted for Isaac. So um, I could see where um, these 144,000, maybe they are virgins. Maybe they are, maybe they are people that were just 100% uh, dedicated. So we'll, we'll let Adonai teach us what that is. But anyway, that's another unique characteristic of, of them. A unique <clears throat> characteristic number four is that they were redeemed from among men. This is very important, right? What does it mean that they were redeemed from among men, right? They were redeemed. What does it mean when, when Adonai redeems you? What's that mean? He buys you back. Who said that? Right. You've been purchased with a price, right? So these people, were, these people were redeemed from among men. That means that they were taken from among men. Now, we're over in Revelation 14 right now. 
Because it says 144,000, it says that they were before the throne. It says they were, they were up in heaven. They were on Mount, they were on Mount Zion. And it says they were, bef- they were before the throne. But it says they were redeemed from among men. So that means that they came from the earth. Adonai, re- it says that they were redeemed from among men. Okay? As a matter of fact, we should, we should, uh, we should read that in context. I should have read that at first because that's, that's it's an important part of the context. Revelation 14. It says, then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And, and then it, it goes on, it says, uh, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, they're virgins. These were redeemed from among men, and look at this, being first fruits unto the lamb. Hmm. First fruits. Very interesting, Right? So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see what that's all about. All right, unique characteristic number five. Revelation 7, 1 through 8 identifies 144,000 as Israelites from the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Th- no, the, these, are, these are descendants of Abraham, okay? This is, not, this is not talking about grafted in. This is talking about from the tribes of, that's what it says, right? That's what it says, right? Okay, we can't, we, you know, we can't just say, well, you know, I thought we were all one in Messiah. <laughs> no, th- this people has a special connection to God. They really, really do. They have a special connection to Adonai. So there are, there are 12,000 from each tribe. They, they you, know, what, you know, they're Israelites, you know, Jews, what, you know, they're Israelites. They're descendants of Abraham, okay? That's who they are, all right? So we're going to reserve characteristics six and seven for later. <laughs> Still playing games, right? All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to connect these 144,000 to somebody, <laughs> We're going to find out who they are. Who do you think they are? Anybody want to venture to guess? Hmm? The tribes? Let's go. Let's go see what they are, okay? This is what we're going to do. We're going to see the unique characteristics of the 144,000 are also the characteristics of another group of people mentioned in the book of Revelation. Hmm. Okay, so let's go and see those. So what all we're going to do here is, all we're going to do is we're going to take these unique characteristics and say, where else do we find these unique characteristics? And that's going to point us so that we know who's who. The 144,000 will not have to endure the time of testing known as the tribulation, right? Remember, that was unique characteristic number one, right? Well, guess what? According to Revelation 3.10, Because you have kept my commandment to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which is to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Overcomers will not endure the testing of the great tribulation. Okay? So the 144,000, remember Revelation 7, 1 through 4, the four angels holding back the four winds until the servants are sealed in their head, and those four winds are the winds of, dest- of destruction, of the great tribulation, right? They need to get sealed so that they can be protected, okay? Well, the overcomers, according to Revelation 3.10, they're not going to, they also so what I want to suggest to you is that the Scripture is connecting the 144,000 to those who overcome. Okay? So let's keep going. Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. So the 144,000 have the father's name written on their foreheads, Right? Let's read Revelation 3.12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. 
Yeshua will write on them the name of his God. So the 144,000 and those who are called overcomers are all going to have God's name written in their forehead. So again, the 144,000 are connected to those who are said to overcome. Okay? All right, let's look at this one. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. All right? According to Revelation 2.14 and 2.20 through 22, overcomers will be victorious over the doctrine of Balaam and the seductions of the prophetess Jezebel by maintaining their spiritual and probably physical purity by avoiding, avoiding harlotry. Okay? Two times in the book of Revelation, it talks about the doctrine of Balaam, and then it also talks about Jezebel, right? How they're causing his servants to stumble by having his, stump, his, his servants commit fornication, okay? Now, whether that's actual physical fornication or spiritual fornication with, with, in worship of other gods in some kind of way or both, either way, okay, Either way, Adonai means it. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is they were not defiled with women for their virgins. That's thematically connected to the overcomers who are victorious over the doctrine of Balaam. Okay? So so these first three characteristics right here show us that the 144,000 are the overcomers. I said comprise of the overcomers, but they're one and the same is what we're seeing here. The 144,000 are the overcomers who heeded the master's warnings to the congregations in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Because in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he writes to the seven congregations and he says, and remember he admonishes each congregation and says, these are the things that I want you to take care of, Okay. These are the things that you need to be tending to. And then he says, you know what? And if you overcome, if you overcome, and then he gives all sorts of promises. And so what we're seeing is we, we, we looked at the unique characteristics of the 144,000. Now all we're doing is matching up the, 140, the, the characteristics of the 144,000 with the overcomers. The 144,000 are marked for special reward as a result of their faithful service and dedication to Yeshua and his purposes. Okay? But the 144,000 are also connected to another group. All right? Hmm. All right, so does everyone see how we've connected the 144,000 to the overcomers through those three promises? Now let's look again. They're also connected to Revelation 14, 4b. It says, these were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay? They were redeemed from among men. That means that they were on the earth... And remember, we read that they're on Mount Zion now before the throne. They were were on earth, but they were redeemed, and now they're in heaven. Is there another place in the book of Revelation that talks about taking some people from earth and bring them up to heaven? Revelation 12, 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. In other words, the man child, they were caught up to God and to his throne. And that's exactly what it says of the 144,000. They were redeemed from among men, they were taken from among men. And right here, the man-child and her child, the man-child was caught up to God and to his throne. Okay? So that's where it's telling you right there, that the 144,000 are the man-child. But it says it again. Revelation 7, 1 through 8, identifies 144,000 as Israelites from the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Well, Revelation 12, 5 says, she, and who is she? She is Israel, and if she bears a male child, he's going to be blood-born Israelite. So there's another connection. 
Revelation 7, 1 through 8 identified the 144,000 as Israelites from all 12 tribes. And that's exactly what's happening in Revelation 12, 5 with the man-child. The man-child is that group of people born from the nation of Israel. They're Israelites. They're, they're Jewish, okay? Uh, yeah. How we want to say that, right? That's another connection. The 144,000 are the man-child of Revelation 12. They're also the overcomers. They're all three in the same. They're just given different names depending on the context where you read them in the book of Revelation. When Yeshua was writing to the seven congregations, he said, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, seven times. That's why we said they're called overcomers. But then the Bible talks about 144,000 people in two different places, Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. But then we see that that 144,000, they're the same as the man-child. They're blood-born Israelites. They were redeemed from among men. They were taken from the earth and caught up to God, just like in Revelation 14. The 144,000 were redeemed from among men. 144,000, the overcoming man-child. Oh, my goodness. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I need to get a drink of water here. I want you guys to read Revelation 14.1 just quietly. And I want you to look at, what, as you read it, I want you to look and tell me if anything looks peculiar to you. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Does anything look a little out of place? Yeah, but that's just because he's copying. So, but yeah, you're right. He's just, he's copying. Mm, no, yeah, he's, that, that's, his, that's his hood. <laughs> that's his territory, right? Okay, uh, double blessing. <laughs> mm hmm. Yep. So, what's the emphasis there that you see? Okay. Uh huh. Okay, for, oh, they're coming back with him for the battle. Okay, all right. All right, so let, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give you guys some other verses. So look at that. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 have his father's name written. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Revelation 4.10, that's a, a vision of God's throne in heaven. And it talks about how the 24 elders fall down before God's throne, right? Because they're worshiping the Almighty, right? Because God is sitting in his holiness on his throne. And they're crying out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. They're the created beings, and they're worshiping him, so they fall down before him. The four living creatures and the 24 elders in Revelation chapter 5, they fall down before the Lamb who's worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory, right? But where are the 24 elders and where are those four living creatures? They're before the Lamb. He's up there and they're just before him because they're rendering, they're rend they're rendering worship to him. Revelation chapter 8 verse 2, and I saw the seven angels. And where were those seven angels standing? Before God. 
in Revelation 7, 9, after these things, so this, now this is a vision of all of the saved, all of the elect. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, and they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, rendering their worship. Mm-hmm, it is. Now let's look at Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. And what does it say? And with him. Really? With him? Not before him? There are people standing with him. Do, 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 you, do you get what's happening here? Remember when I told you that Yeshua said that he who overcomes will rule with a rod of iron? Remember I told you that he said he, in Revelation 3.20, he that rules with me, he will sit on my throne with me. All through the book of Revelation, they're standing before the Lamb and before God. And right here, we have 144,000 who are standing with the Lamb because they're one with Him. It's 144,000. Because He overcame and they overcame. These are the 144,000 that are going to rule and reign with Him. They're standing with Him. They're standing with Him. Now, all of these other pictures, everyone's standing before him because they're giving glory and honor to him. The audacity of 144 people to stand with Yeshua. And yet it's not the audacity at all. And don't think that I'm just, you know, this, well, you know, he's, uh, he's making a little bit much out of this. No, these guys are standing with Messiah. Because these are the ones who have paid the price. I'm telling you that 144,000, those are some bad dudes. <laughs> you know what they're like? I just, I just thought about this. They're like David's mighty men. Ooh-wee! You're talking about some bad dudes. Oh, my goodness. David's mighty men, the three and the 30. <laughs> the three and the 30. But saints, th these are the 144,000. And they, they have lived their lives in such a way. I, I'm, I'm telling you something. I, I'm just praying that, that Adonai continues to open my eyes and all of our eyes, because I, I know I don't see everything the way I need to. <laughs> It wasn't until two days, it wasn't until about three days ago, and I had already prepared all my slides, and I looked at that, and I was like, what? A lamb standing on Mazda, and with him, 144,000. And then I, that's when I started going, looking through all, you know, before him, before him, before him, before him. Somebody's standing with Yeshua. He's the king. Everyone's standing before him to pay homage to him, because he's king of kings and lord of lords. Right? These people are standing with Yeshua on Mount Zion before the throne of God. So they're with Yeshua standing before the throne of God right here. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000. With him. Mm, 144,000. And then it goes on down here in verse 5. And in their mouth was found no deceit for they are without fault before the throne of God. They're right there with Yeshua standing right next to him. These would be like Paul's, the Apostle Paul. You know what all he gave? <laughs> Joshua, some of the greats. Yeah. 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 All, all, some of the. For zealous, yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, th- that whole thing with the virgins. Yeah. yeah. And I think it can go both ways. Yeah. Either one is awesome. <laughs> right. So these are 104. These are the 144,000 that have earned that spot. Okay. Yes. Mm. Uh. Yes. Yes. Good connection. Good connection. Very good. Very good. Very good. The 144,000 are standing with Yeshua, not before him. All the multitude of saints from all generations stand before the Lamb, but that 144,000, they stand with the Lamb. They stand with the Lamb because they're that man-child, okay? They're that man-child. Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. The man-child is the same as the overcomers who are the same of the 144,000. They're the ones who will rule and reign with Yeshua on his throne for eternity. And that's why they're rewarded in such a way, okay? So we're going to, when we, when we do the last... When, Oh, okay, no, we've got one more, okay. <laughs> Forgot about that. All right, here's another one. Okay, so now you guys, you guys need, to, need to think. When I was here before, we talked about, we talked about uh, the second coming of the Messiah. We talked about uh, when the resurrection and the gathering together uh, of the saints are. So let's go to Revelation 14, and let's just kind of, let's talk about, well, no, actually, let's go over to, let me see, hold on, hold on. Let me see, let me see what's coming up here next. Let's look at, let's do this. Unique characteristic number seven. The 144,000 who were redeemed from among men, it says that they are the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They're the first fruits. So I'm going to ask you a question. First fruits of what? Of the harvest, right? Who said that? They're the first fruits of the harvest. Remember when I was here and we were talking about the harvest and we said... And we talked about the parable of the sower, and we talked about the parable of the wheat and the tares. And the parable of the wheat and the tares is all about how Adonai has been sowing seed into the earth through all generations of mankind, right? And he says there's coming one big harvest, right? There's coming one big, huge harvest, right? But it says that these guys are the first fruits of the harvest. So whenever there's a harvest... If, if, if we're, we're Messianic, right, and we're studying our Hebraic roots, then one of the first things that we learn is what? You always have first fruits, right? You take the best. And see, I just thought, see, I hadn't thought about that within the context of 144,000. Again, they're the best. They're the cream of the crop, the overcomers, the man child, the 144,000. They are the cream of the crop, they are the first fruits, okay? They are the first fruits unto the Lamb. The man-child that overcomes 144,000 will comprise the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. They're going to be the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to see that. Now, a great, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon, as we said, he knows that his time is short. He knows what's about to happen, through, uh, uh, just like he knew when Moses was born and when he knew that Yeshua was born. So he's doing what he always does when he knows that a man-child is about to be destroyed who can crush his head. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child, the overcomers, the 144,000, who will rule all nations with a rod of iron, according to Revelation 2.26 and 3.20. 
And it says, and her child was caught up. Her potso. That's that word that's used, right, for the revela- for the for the uh, for the rapture over in First Thessalonians. Here it is, right here. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. There's your first fruits resurrection right there. There's your first fruits resurrection. And then what happens? He's caught up to God's throne. There's a war in heaven. And as a result of the war, Satan's cast down, and then he goes and persecutes that woman and the remnant of her seed for 1,260 days. So the first fruits of resurrection is right at the beginning of the, tribula- the great tribulation. It's the resurrection of the first fruits saints right here of the, of the man child. It's their resurrection that kicks off the events of the great tribulation. When Satan tries to stop it. And now we also understand what's going on here. You know what's going on? You know what Satan's trying to do? Because we're saying that this man child is 144,000, and it says 144,000 are the first fruits unto God. They're the first fruits of the resurrection. So think about that. Adonai is about to resurrect. The 144,000 as first fruits of the resurrection. And it's Satan here who is standing before the woman so that he can devour that first fruits. He's trying to prevent the resurrection of the dead. So remember I, remember I told you that when we first started this thing off five lessons ago, and we looked at the chiastic structure of the book of Revelation. Remember I said, we're going to take care of this technical stuff first. But you know what? The, mo- the most beautiful thing that comes out of that technical stuff is the central axis. Remember I told you that in order to understand the book of Revelation, what's really kind of going on, Adonai is pointing us to Revelation chapter 12. And then remember how we saw that if you want to interpret Revelation chapter 12, you've got to go to Genesis 3, 15 and 16. Revelation chapter 12 is a perfect fulfillment of, gener- of Genesis 3, 15 through 16. But it's just not, it was not Yeshua, it was, it was the saints, right? Sh- Satan, how God will crush Satan under your feet, okay? Your feet. Primarily talking about the 144,000, but us also. All those in the nations who are going to be giving a witness of our lives, to Yeshua. This is the reason why. So what's happening here is the man child, he's born, he's resurrected, he's caught the heaven. Satan is trying to get him right when he's resurrected, trying to prevent that. He goes to heaven. Adonai brings him up to heaven. He's thwarted. Adonai says, enough is enough. There's a big war in heaven with um, the devil and his angels and Michael and his angels, right? They kick Satan out of heaven. They're like, you out of here, dude. And then they say, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. And he persecuted the woman 1,260 days. Isn't that three and a half years? Well, we got a choice. We can either say that it happened at the beginning of the first three and a half years, or we can say that this is beginning, uh, that, this, that this happened at the beginning of the second three and a half. Well, to me, it makes sense that it was the second three and a half, because he knows this time is short. Okay? So, this, Satan's trying to prevent, he's trying to, he's trying to for, prevent the resurrection of God's saints, is what's going on here. Okay? All right. Summary. So we looked at the unique characteristics of the 144,000. They're thematically connected to the overcomers of Revelation 2, 3. They're also connected to the man-child of Revelation 12. They're all one and the same, just different names, different contexts. 144,000 are connected to those who will rule with Yeshua. Oh, my goodness. 
144,000 standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. What a sight. 144,000 uh, are also those who are going to be resurrected first. Go, uh, last thing here, uh, before we, last thing before we take a quick break to get into the last message. Last message is going to be kind of like more of a, just kind of a big summary. Big, big summary. Not too much new. <clears throat> so here's the play-by-play -play if you go to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, what it does is it, it gives you an outline or a summary of the harvests. Okay, so we said in Revelation 12, when the man child is caught up to God's throne, that was that that was that harvest there. Now, it's talked about it's given more detail right here in chapter 14. The first five verses are the harvest of those hundred and forty four thousand. It's, it's the results of it. They're up in heaven now. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpers harping, playing their harps. Uh, they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. How many of you know why they're singing this? You know why they're singing the song? Because every time in the Bible where there's a great salvation, you sing at the splitting of the Red Sea, what did they do? That great act of salvation. The 144,000. Why does it say that no one can learn that song except for those 144,000? Nobody else but those 144,000. Because those are 144,000 people who share the same experience of being overcomers who follow the Lamb everywhere in their life and were totally sold out to Yeshua. They share that, and so they're able to sing that song, and no one else can sing it because no one else paid the price the way they did, whoever these people are. The Scripture says, of whom the world is not worthy. Yeah. Of whom the world is not worthy. They killed the disciples. And the apostles, in the worst ways that you can imagine. Scripture says they were sawn asunder. They endured unspeakable trials and trouble. Of whom the world is not worthy. Not one of them is worthy. The way they persecute Adonai's people and the way they do it even to this day. A hundred and forty four thousand. They sing that song because of that shared experience. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men because they're first fruits to God and to the Lamb because of the harvest. They're the first fruits of the harvest. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. That's your, that's your, your right before the great tribulation starts. That's when they're going to go up. Here's the resurrection of all the rest of the saints. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud. What does Yeshua say all in the Gospels? A white cloud. He's going to be coming on a white cloud, right? He's going to be coming on a cloud. And then this is where we have it. Matthew 24, 31, that whole area there. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like who? The Son of Man. All those passages about Yeshua's second coming in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, or Luke 21, it all talks about it's the coming of the Son of Man. And they talk about that word coming, and they use the phrase Son of Man. And they say, on the clouds. Because those are all connections so that when we get here, we understand this is what Yeshua was talking about. we got to read it. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So this is some of what we, what we covered last time. Matthew 24, 31. Uh, immediately after, 
The immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will grow darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then the tribes of all the earth will mourn when, and they will see the Son of Man coming. See, Son of Man, right? Coming on the clouds of heaven, right? With great power and with glory. He will send forth his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect. It's not rapture, it's gathering together his elect from the four winds from one, e from one end of heaven to the other. Revelation 14, 14, Then behold, I saw a white cloud. There's the white cloud. And on the, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. There's the Son of Man. Having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud saying, Thrust in your sickle and reap for the time for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Remember, Yeshua always talked about the harvest the being ripe, sent out laborers. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle, and the earth was reaped. There's your general resurrection right there, all the same. This right here, what I just read, is Matthew 24, 31, that I just read to you, Matthew 24, 31, where he said he's going to gather you from one end of heaven to the other. This is it right here, Matthew, I mean, Revelation 14, 14 through 16, and then the last thing here is there's another harvest. There's, there's one more harvest that God's got on, got on his mind, on his heart. And it's here in verse 17 through 20. And another angel came out of the altar, from the altar, who had the power of a fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the, wine was, and, the, and the wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That is fulfilled in Revelation 19 when Yeshua returns. In Revelation 19, that's when that actually occurs. What's happening in Revelation 14 is he's giving you pictures of first, the first fruits resurrection. He gives you a picture of the, of, the, of, the, of the resurrection of the saints in general, verses 14 through 16. And then verses 17, 17 through 20 is the, uh, the harvest of the vintage when, when he actually returns. So Revelation chapter 12, that was the watershed chapter that uh, contains so much. So Father, in Yeshua's name, we just want to thank you. Um, for your goodness, Lord, and we just thank you, and we just ask, Father, that uh, you would just open our eyes and help us to understand your words, and we just pray, Father, in Yeshua's name, that the book of Revelation, oh my, Father, that we would just love this book. There's a special blessing, you said, for us to read it and to do it and obey it. Father, we just, we just thank you, Lord, that we're not children of the night, that the day should take us unawares. We ask, Father, that you would prepare our hearts uh, for things that are going to be happening on the earth. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to be a light and a source of strength in the days to come. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Thank you.